You know, Nora, I, I tried donating blood today, and I will never do that again. You know, uh, they, they, were, they were just, they were asking me too many questions. They're like, whose blood is this? How did you get it? Why, why is it in the bucket? So, you know, maybe, maybe not for me, donating blood. All right. That was darker than I thought yeah. we would go. Yeah. <laughs> not expect that one. The Curbsiders Podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. Furthermore, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host and should not be interpreted to reflect the official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like moral hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we are responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. Um, welcome back to The Curbsiders. I'm Dr. Matthew Otto. As you can see, without Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams tonight, but I am joined by the great Dr. Nora Toronto and uh, another fantastic co-host who we will introduce in a second. Uh, Nora, tonight we're going to be talking about hypercoagulable workup with the great Dr. Gene Connors. And I understand that you had a big hand in helping with this episode. And uh, anything to say? You know, I just, uh, I'm excited to learn more about this. I have gotten many, many consults on this in my short time as a hematology oncology fellow. And so I am glad to be learning from one of the world experts on it tonight. (laughs) Yeah, it it definitely, uh, this is a lot less of a gray area now, although I feel like it's probably always going to be a gray area for everybody, um, as you'll see when we go through the discussion, because there's a lot of nuance to the decision making. Uh, Nora, can you remind people, since Paul's not here, uh, can you remind people, what is it that we do on the Curbsiders? And then if you would introduce our other co-host. Sure, Matt. We are the internal medicine podcast, and we use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. And tonight we have the amazing producer, Malini Gandhi, here with us, um, and she's going to tell us all about our guest and the topic tonight. How are you doing, Malini? I'm doing well. Tonight we had a really fantastic conversation with Dr. Jean Connors. She is a hematology attending at Brigham Women's Hospital and Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, um, as well as the medical director of the Anticoagulation Management Services and the Hemostatic Antithrombotic Stewardship Program, as well as an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. And she gave us a lot of really fantastic pearls on who to test for thrombophilia, what type of workup to send, and how to interpret the results, as well as some fantastic pearls on antiphospholipid syndrome. We're really excited to have her here today. And before we get to the interview, a reminder that this and most episodes are available for CME through VCU Health at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. Our guest did report that she has consulted for Bristol, Bristol Myers Squibb, Pfizer, and Janssen. However, uh, we used generic drug names on the episode, and the conversation was fair and balanced, talking about a a range of therapeutic options. So with all that, let's get on to the episode. All right. So we have a case of Ms. S. She's a 38-year-old woman, doesn't have any significant past medical history, and she presents to urgent care with a day of unilateral white right calf swelling and tenderness after she had just gotten back from a 20-hour nonstop flight from Singapore back to New York City. She gets the lower extremity ultrasound that's consistent with the DVT. She tells you she doesn't take any medications. Her family history is significant for a DVT in her mother during pregnancy at age 34, as well as a DVT in her sister at the age of 42 that she believes was unprovoked. She doesn't really know the details or if any of them got testing for thrombophilia. She started on rivaroxaban, and you're seeing her now for follow-up in primary care clinic a week later. You're considering whether to test her for inherited or acquired forms of thrombophilia. So to start out with, wanted to ask you just in general how you go about taking a history from a patient such as this um, in terms of the, the, um, the present history as well as family history. You know, this is an excellent case, and I actually do see these kinds of patients um, in my clinic all the time. Uh, and they can cause a lot of anxiety in someone who's young and has no other medical problems and, and hasn't been hospitalized. So I, I think you've hit some of the highlights in this patient's history, right? 
We look for, first of all, the personal history of thrombosis, whether they've not only had thrombosis themselves in the past, but also whether they've had any challenges, right? So did they have their appendix out? Did they break their leg and were they in a cast? Did they take oral contraceptives? Um, All of those factors in a young woman um, would be challenges uh, for risk of thrombosis, um, as well as pregnancy. Uh, so pregnancy and oral contraceptive use are things that we ask. And then um, as nicely obtained in this, this um, patient's family history, we ask not only has anyone in the family had thrombosis, but at what age have they had thrombosis, right? So like grandpa with prostate cancer at age 76, having a PE is not the kind of history we're looking for. We're looking for people who've had thrombotic events primarily under the age of 50, because that's where you get concerned that the threshold for, for getting a clot is lower. It takes more to have a clot when you're under the age of 50 than you're, when you're over the age of 50. And so we, that's why age is, is such an important factor. And again, as you point out, what's going on? So her mother had a clot during pregnancy. Pregnancy is one of the highest risk states for women uh, for developing a VTE. Uh, and, and so those are all important factors. Seasoned coagulation experts can tell a patient based on their family history what the likelihood is of having a thrombophilia uh, because I see a lot of patients who have uh, sort of a number of environmental factors that all collide and cause the perfect storm to have a clot and they have no family history. Those patients, it's very unlikely that you're going to get a clot. But here we have a clear family history in two first degree relatives, right? So the mother and the sister. The second degree relatives are less concerning to us, you know. So Uncle John's daughter um, is not somebody that we really care about whether or not they had had a, a VTE. Yeah, this is, I, I find that this topic, um, what, and we're going to get into this, of course, but it's just as we, and we were talking about this beforehand, it's just like, even if we do identify, um, you know, it, it's still confusing, but it's, it's good to know. I think it's very good information that that age less than 50 and that you're saying first degree. So that's like siblings or parents. Those are the ones that we care about most. And so even like grandparents, aunts and uncles, that's, that's less it's less compelling, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it really, really look at, at the f- first degree family members. One of the reasons that age is is not so concerning, um, age at the event, right? So mm-hmm. again, it's not that grandpa was 76 when, you know, um, but, or is 76 now, but that he had his clot at age 76, right? If he had a clot at age 40, you might be a little more concerned. Um, and inflammation actually drives up risk for thrombosis in older patients. And there's a great manuscript in hematology in 2007 that you can just look at the curve and then it hits 60 and it goes up uh, very sort of non-linearly. It's, it's fascinating. So that's why we know that people who have clots under the age of 50, there is some other factor besides the, say, a provoking factor in, in this patient who, who had a 20-hour flight, right? It makes it easier for them to develop a clot than other people their age. But, but the age, and, and also, too, the type of um, thrombosis, you know, again, I, I get a lot of patients who say, well, you know, my grandmother had a stroke, right? And so, again, a stroke at age 67 is not the same as uh, you know, the father had a PE at age 42. Uh, and, and, and sometimes I do ask, well, what was the setting? You know, well, my father had knee construction, reconstruction surgery at age 42. And so you kind of get a sense of, of, you know, factors that contributed. In terms of weighting of the different risk factors and the way that you think about, uh, them, do you have a, a framework uh, to say it sounds like first degree relatives and that family history is obviously kind of hot, quite high in terms of thinking about thrombophilia, but other risk factors uh, and parts of the history that make you think about the um, likelihood of, of 
throbbing. Well, again, I, I think, you know, as we've sort of been hinting at age, right? Age yeah. is a huge um, component. The younger you are, the stronger the factor has to be to, to cause a clot. And so if you're already, we know that inherited thrombophilias lower the threshold at which you develop a clot, right? So, so, you know, two people sitting on a plane from Singapore for 20 hours, right? One has an inherited thrombophilia, that bar for that, the the stimulus for them to get a clot is lower than someone who doesn't have an inherited thrombophilia. And so that's, that's kind of how we look at it. And these factors are all sort of synergistic too. And, and I could go on about, um, what we consider strong risk factors versus moderate versus weak and, you know, where the field has sort of fallen out on some of these. Uh, For example, you know, major abdominal pelvic surgery or joint joint surgery is much more prothrombotic in neurosurgery um, than, say, you know, having a mole removed, right? Uh, Or, you know, a lower extremity fracture and casting in immobilization much more concerning than like breaking your elbow. So uh, those are the the types of factors we look at with regard to major provoking factors. Uh, Flight and air travel is one which is fascinating. We all sort of in the COAG world think, you know, most of us think that there's definitely a contributing factor. Um, In the past, it was considered just a weak factor alone. And so, you know, the people look for other things, including inherited thrombophilia. I tend to firmly believe in that and, and do think it, it is a significant factor. Uh, and, and I take that seriously. Another factor is estrogen. So again, as I've alluded to, pregnancy is one of the highest prothrombotic states, uh, particularly the first six weeks after delivery. That's exact. Um, amplified by C-section, but also oral contraceptives. And and I just gave a presentation actually um, to the uh, hematology and obstetrics uh, group in New Zealand uh, last Friday night in in Australia about the risk of hormonal treatments and and thrombosis. Uh, And, you know, we forget, uh, we we prescribe millions of, of birth control pill prescriptions per year, but the risk, the odds ratio of having thrombosis is about three and a half. Um, for a woman compared to no hormonal contraceptives at all. So something to keep in mind when you're talking to your patients. Is that true of uh, uh, estrogen replacement therapy and also IVF-related hormones? So those are great questions, right? Um, so so um, the type of estrogen matters. So the type of estrogens we use for combination oral contraceptives, ethanol estradiol, plus a progestin agent, um, is very different from what we use for for menopausal, postmenopausal hormone replacement, which which is estradiol uh, or E2. And so the dosing, the formulation, and the risks are very, very different. They're much higher with ethanol estradiol than they are with the the estradiol formulation itself. All right. Well, we want to try to figure out who we should test um, Molly, I think you have a bunch of, so, well, well, first of all, this woman that we gave you here, this is a 38 year old. She has this family history and, uh, we, we've diagnosed a clot in her. Is she somebody that we should think about testing as, as the primary care that's seeing her in follow up? So that is, you probably are aware, is a very controversial topic, sure. right? <laughs> and, and I, I wrote a review 2017 published in New England Journal. Yes, and people, amazing. People, people yeah. read that and say, oh, Gene, I know you never test people. And, <laughs> and that's not actually true. <laughs> what, what, what you need to know is why are you testing this person and what are you going to do with the results? Because mm-hmm. I have seen so many people, they've had like their gallbladder out and they get a DVT or, or a PE and then they, someone tests them and, and it might make sense, you know, maybe she's a 42 year old woman and, you know, had her gallbladder out and they find heterozygous factor five Leiden and then they put that ant- patient on anticoagulation like forever, right? And that is not indicated in those situations. So uh, although having an inherited thrombophilia decreases your threshold for getting a clot, 
it doesn't appear to increase your risk of a recurrence. Um, as I like to say, as long as when you when that patient encounters other you know, high risk situations that they get appropriate prophylaxis. Uh, so, so I think I would test this woman for a couple of different reasons, right? Um, she probably wants to know why she got a thrombosis. She has two family members, including a sister who might benefit from knowing. Uh, I will tell you that I have found that if you label someone as having an inherited thrombophilia, Surgical specialties tend to take a little more notice of, of you know, the patient's risk for thrombosis uh, and reach out and ask about perioperative prophylaxis. Uh, and, and I think our surgeons are so much more aware of thrombotic risk now than they were even 10 years ago. But when you've got someone who carries that diagnosis, then, uh, you know, it, it, it flags it for everyone's attention. Um the converse is that we know that in patients, so say this person has factor V Leiden, is heterozygous, and, and you test her and you tell her, and then her mother goes and gets tested, and her mother's heterozygous for factor V Leiden. So her sister goes and gets tested, but her sister's not. We know that that sister still has probably a higher risk of thrombosis than someone whose family does not have factor V Leiden mm. because factor V Leiden doesn't act the same from family to family. And so we think there are other modifiers that are either genetic or environmental that no one's been able to identify. And it seems to have more penetrance, if you will, in some families than others. So that's one of the caveats of testing and one of the downfalls, just because you're negative doesn't mean you don't have the risk. Uh, so we, I'm very careful to tell patients that. So it sounds like she would be tested. Like, let, let me let me throw out some tests. So there's the, is it fair to call them gain of function? I feel like nowadays that is a whole different con connotation, but uh, the prothrombin and the factor five are the gain yeah. of function ones. Yeah. And then there's the, the antithrombin, the protein C and protein S. Yes. Anything else that is this, your standard test? No, and, and that's a, an excellent question. So I call them prothrombotic mutations, and then I call them uh, inherited deficiencies of, of anti, natural anticoagulants or deficiencies of the anticoagulant proteins. And so it's very fascinating that prothrombin gene mutation G20210A and the factor V Leiden mutation are point mutations, right? And they're thought to have been like a founder effect, like somebody in the Netherlands had factor V Leiden <laughs> mutation because it was the Netherlands. And actually, if you go to the Netherlands, like 20% of the population there has factor V Leiden, heterozygous. But in the days of the Romans, right, it, it protected them from bleeding to death uh, and with trauma. And so it was perpetuated in the population. Uh, and prothrombin gene, um, the same way. The deficiencies of the natural anticoagulants, protein C, protein S, and antithrombin, each one has almost over 200 known mutations. And in those, those um, proteins, we can then definitely have um, uh, abnormalities in quantity or abnormalities in function. So you can have mutations in antithrombin that um, decrease the amount and it works fine, or you can have some mutations that affects its functional activity. I, since I have this opportunity, uh, I'm going to digress and, and hope we get to the second case. But um, protein S, and, and this is why you have to be careful when you test these, protein S actually circulates in two forms, okay? It, it circulates in, a, you, you look at total, so it circulates bound to something called C4B binding protein and free. And it's the free that um, participates in its anticoagulant functions. So when you have inflammation, like those people with Crohn's disease or, or out of control lupus, your C4B complement um, 4B binding protein goes up because you're activating complement. And so now you have these fragments and it binds free protein S and now your free protein S levels drop. And so that's one of the problems if you're going to test for those five inherited thrombophilias. Uh, the point mutations for factor V Leiden and prothrombin gene are 
are PCR-based tests. So you can do those tests at any time in anyone's course because mm-hmm. nothing affects those DNA levels, right, or the DNA findings. Um, protein C, protein S are very dependent, uh, particularly protein S and antithrombin about for, um, with what's going on in the patient's milieu. So if they're inflamed, if they're in the hospital, they've got an infection or something else is going on, your protein S levels are going to be low um, and protein C may drop as well. If your patient's on heparin, your antithrombin levels may be low as well. So that's why when, you know, we talk about timing of testing and what to test and when, you have to be very careful, particularly with protein S because of that ratio uh, between free and bound. Yeah, I've seen a number of patients who have had labs that were drawn and and it's just impossible to interpret the protein S and protein C yep. levels because they were on a number of different medications and also acutely ill with infections or yes. active malignancy and so it's so it it can be very challenging. I guess uh, one question that this brings up is do you when you're th- ordering these tests, do you order all five of them together or are there people that you do only two of the five in? So this is also an excellent question and and it depends on on who you talk to uh, about how you should do this, right? Um, And and so I will say a, a couple of things. I mean, in general, I tend, like in this patient, we don't know anything about the family members. So I would absolutely order all five and only those five. And I could get into an esoteric discussion about how some people think like elevated factor eight levels are associated with increased risk, but no one has been able to find a gene that correlates with that, right? Mm -hmm. And MTHFR, you should never test MTHFR (laughs) because it's a polymorphism and 25% of the world population has an MTHFR polymorphism. So back to these. So I usually do test um, um, the the entire panel, um, but at an appropriate time. Sometimes if if you're really concerned, like, you know, and and they're, you know, I'm seeing them in my my office like two weeks after they've had a PE and there's no way I'm going to stop their anticoagulation, I might send the factor five and the prothrombin gene mutation. The prevalence, though, in different um, race and ethnic groups is really, really important to know, right? So it's um, like if you look at the U.S. population, well, first of all, if you look at the U.S. population in total, this is one of my soapbox campaigns, less than 10% of the U.S. population in total has any one of those, all of them combined, um, are found in less than 10% of our population, yet at least 40% of our population is obese. And then, so if you look at the VTE, um, like the hazard ratio or the odds ratio for developing a VTE in someone who has a BMI over 30 or 35, it's the same as if you're heterozygous uh, prothrombin gene mutation. It's very, very, they're very like, like 2.3, 2.7, maybe pushing towards three, depending on what population. So we have all these people running around doing, with good intention, doing inherited thrombophilia workup in people who have BMIs of 40 or 45. And that's a huge factor um, in developing uh, thrombosis. So for Mrs. Miss S, she had this long flight to Singapore, but her family history, two people, two first degree relatives under 50 with clots. One of them seems like we couldn't, it was unprovoked, like truly unprovoked. So She's on rivaroxaban right now. Uh, we said we were going to test her. And so what would that conversation sound like? And how would you explain to her when the testing should be done? Yeah, so great questions, right? How do you manage this in, in practice? When someone is on anticoagulation, you're, you're, you know, particularly with a new clot, we don't like to interrupt it at all mm-hmm. in the first 12 weeks at all. And there's no reason to. The only time that we get concerned about the, the anticoagulant is if you really suspect someone has antiphospholipid syndrome. And, and antiphospholipid syndrome is a whole other discussion um, in a, because um, a, antiphospholipid syndrome is a spectrum, right? And so we have people who have recurrent strokes despite adequate anticoagulation. And, and, and you can pick out, again, somebody who has high risk of, of having uh, 
true antifossil lipid syndrome because they usually have an arterial event and they may often have two arterial events before you actually see them and put them on warfarin. But outside of that, um, in this particular patient, I'm very comfortable. She's got a caffeine DVT. She had a 20 hour flight. She has a family history. So she probably has, you know, an inherited thrombophilia. I would absolutely, you know, wait three to six months, keep her on anticoagulation, say to her, hey, you know, we're going to stop your anticoagulation and then bring her in and test her no sooner than three days and in even a week or two weeks after stopping. Because there's no reason to, to, to um, know the thrombophilia status at that time, right? You're not going to treat her any differently uh, if, you, you know, with an inherited thrombophilia, she has an acute clot. She needs anticoagulation. So with Mrs. S, uh, you said you're going to treat her for three to six months. So that's like the standard treatment for someone with a, a, new, a new clot. We think this was probably provoked, but because of her family history, we, we said we were going to test her. And how might you decide, like if you test her after she's done that initial bout of anticoagulation, what would you tell her going forward uh, based on the results of the testing? Like, how is that going to change future management? So that's an excellent question, because I think in this patient, it's not going to really change our management of her. Um, it may help her understand why she got a clot. And, and believe me, people really want to know, why did this happen to me? Mm -hmm. Why Why did I get a clot? Um, as I said, it may make other providers involved in her care more aware of her risk. Um, one thing that may be important for any children that she might have or children that her sister has um, about the risk of oral contraceptives and pregnancy and risk for clots. And people may look at that, um, you know, differently and may take alternative strategies. In this particular patient, if I find an inherited uh, thrombophilia, it's not going to change what I do with regard to anticoagulation for this acute event. We have a clear provoking factor. Um, and as long as, you know, she's not obese and, ha and not doesn't have other things going on, I would not give her indefinite anticoagulation. I would stop. What I would do and for which there are no guidelines available on this because there are no data, is that when she flies again, um, particularly if like she's going to Singapore for work or Australia or New Zealand or even across, you know, from Boston to California, I would give her what we call air travel prophylaxis. And, and I use off-label, uh, you know, the prophylactic dose of Revaraxaban 10 milligrams or Pixaban 2.5 milligrams every 12 hours for two doses, depending on how long the flight is. Now, and there are lots of society guidelines on this, um, or there, well, there are a lot of society guidelines on how to treat VTE. There are not a lot of guidelines uh, that say anything about travel prophylaxis. The American Society Hematology Guideline on treating uh, thrombosis, treating venous thromboembolism came out in 2018. And it said, well, if you want to use it, you could use Lovenox. And I gave the authors a uh, bunch of crap for like, here was your opportunity to write down what we do in practice, right? Because all of these people usually do give some sort of air travel prophylaxis, but there are no data, uh, right? And, and so again, it's very hard. Um, I think over-treating a 38-year-old woman who appears to have no bleeding risk at all um, and who's already demonstrated that a, a long flight can lead to uh, a, a thrombosis um, is, is, you know, I think the, the, the risk-benefit analysis in my favor, in my view, favors the benefits. And you said, uh, so um, she might get an oxaparin, she might get a lo the lower dose river rivaroxaban, apixaban. And what, what does that look like? Do you tell them start it the day, the day you travel and continue it yeah. for how long? So I usually use the, one of the 10A inhibitor DOACs and mm -hmm. I um, have them take it one to two hours before they get on the plane. That's a benefit of the of Revaraxaban and the Pixaban, which are the two most commonly used uh, 10A inhibitors, uh, because they have on peak onset of action within two to three hours of ingesting 
really, really fantastic. You use an oxaparin and um, it's same thing, but actually the duration of effect is shorter, right? So the half-life of an oxaparin is about six hours, where the half-life of rivaroxaban and apixaban is more like 12. Um, and so for most patients who are normal weight, who I think need uh, travel prophylaxis, I'll usually have them take one dose unless they have a very prolonged, like Singapore is a you know, by the time you start the travel and end the travel, it's much more than 20 hours, right? And you always have to tell patients, eh, this is, again, another one of my pet peeves, uh, some patients don't get the concept of elapsed time, right? So, so you know, like every 12 hours is every 12 hours, right? It's not, you know, 7 o'clock in Boston, 7 p.m. and 7 p.m. in London, okay? No, seriously, I have to like draw clocks for some patients, okay? <laughs> That's for people who are on chronic therapeutic dose. But these patients, they take one um, or they take a Pixaban 12 hours later, and that's it. So we've covered a 24-hour period. There are some patients who might be significantly obese or they have varicose veins, and I will have them do another day. Then during like the time they're on vacation, they don't take any, but then they do what they did to, you know, to travel to wherever they're at um, in the reverse. The only caveat is I had a retired surgeon who had some varicose veins, had had a lot of DVTs. I said, oh, you don't need to be on anticoagulation indefinitely, but you should take it when you fly to Europe. Um, and he's like, okay, great. And he did. But then he forgot to tell me that he was going to sit in a bus for eight to 10 hours a day for like four days in a row on this bus tour through like, you know, the Swiss Alps and France. And, and you're like, well, no wonder you got a DVT, right? So, so it's it's amazing what you have to ask patients, right? So, <laughs> so um, I, I'm very careful to ask patients about extended travel because I've seen we all tend to feel that six hours is probably like you know the minimum duration of flight, but for some patients, I'll even you know, they could fly from Boston to Florida. Or what I've seen happen is patients fly to Ohio, but then they get in a car and drive another five hours. So their elapsed travel time is really like nine hours. And then it becomes, you know, um, more of a, uh, a substantial risk. And have you had any issues getting insurance coverage after the like three to six months of initial rivaroxaban or apixaban? No, but um, that is one of my insurance coverage is a whole nother uh, curbsiders that I would love to come back and discuss. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> because we actually had conversations with, I was involved with conversations with CBS, Caremark, and their pharmacy benefits management plan and prior authorizations back in December 2021. Uh, so that's another story. But no, um, I, I don't. Um, okay. the, the thing is that uh, most commercial insurance com uh, in in payers will cover um, uh, Rivaroxaban or Apixaban. And what I do often is for people who usually get a provoked clot like this woman, um, it, it, the Singapore trip, if that was a one-off, never to be repeated you know, there's no need to write a prescription on the spot. A lot of people I see travel frequently for work. I write them a month's prescription, right? And oh, so yeah. that's that's like 15 trips in a year. Wow, this is a totally foreign concept to me. I yeah. did I did not know this was going on at all. This is this so this is good to know. And yeah, I, along similar lines, it, it would if this person was wanting to get pregnant in the future, um, how does that conversation go? Yeah, so that conversation um, is in flux uh, at this point in time. It used to be that, um, so say you discovered uh, inherited factor five Leiden in the family, and it, it, whether she herself uh, or a first degree relative had a thrombotic event, you would give her prophylaxis during pregnancy. Um, a recent study that came out, well, this was more of a dose finding study. So we, we, we used to try to um, look at 40 milligrams in oxaparin versus weight-based one milligram per kilogram once a day. Uh, and it seems that that may not make a difference in preventing thrombotic events in, uh, in that 40 milligrams in oxaparin once a day in pregnancy is, is sufficient. But what we're trying to wrestle with is who really needs it. And so some people would say if this person had had, you know, patient um, had had 
uh, an estrogen provoked clot, then absolutely you should give anticoagulation during pregnancy. Mm. Now, um, I tend to, again, if the patient is willing, um, you know, and they've had a thrombotic event, err on the side of, of however you want, either being cautious and in, in giving prophylaxis or being aggressive in, in giving prophylaxis, depending on how you look at it. Because in managing a, an acute VTE during pregnancy is a little more difficult. Uh, and, you know, you've got to give therapeutic dose, you've got to, you know, arrange for delivery and, and all of that. Uh, and so the downsides during pregnancy are the once a day injections, because the direct oral anticoagulants are such tiny molecules that they cross the placenta. Mm -hmm. So we, we can't use those. Um, so so I, I think in this patient, you know, for pregnancy, I would have a discussion with her. I have had patients, actually, I have a patient who is a physician uh, who was heterozygous factor five Leiden and found out, but she herself had never, never had a clot. She had a family member who had it. And she and her husband came in and we had a very long discussion uh, about the pros and the cons. And she decided that she didn't want to do it um, and do an oxaparin every day. But I also trusted her to be pretty vigilant about uh, investigating symptoms and not not tossing them off and, and waiting um, you know, long enough to, to get a PE or something like that. And I know, Nora, you had brought up infertility treatments, right? So again, that's another area that kind of like air travel prophylaxis where we don't have a lot of data. And so I work very closely with our reproductive endocrine people. Um, and um, if for some regimens, the infertility regimens, like they'll have a woman take a month's worth of oral contraceptives, I will definitely use anticoagulation during that time period. And then around the whole IVF stuff, there's also something called uh, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, which is very much associated with thrombosis. I, I think now all the infertility docs recognize that if someone appears to be developing ovarian hyperstimulation, they will give them uh, anticoagulation. Can I switch gears a little bit? So it sounds like we've, we've sorted this patient. We've talked to her. If she has a pregnancy, that sounds like that's going to be a conversation about whether or not she wants an oxyparin. If this clot had been provoked by estrogen, it would be a stronger indication. We want to give you a bunch of variances here. And one that <laughs> comes up a lot, I often see like a young man, like man under 50 that has a clot. And if you can't figure out why they had it, um, or, or maybe there's like a week, oh, I was sick like a month ago, but then you discover the clot like a month later. Uh, do those people get lifelong anticoagulation? Like how do we, uh, do, do those yeah. people warrant testing? That, that seems to come up a lot. And I often see those people getting tested, although I'm not sure what's being done with the results. Yeah, no, so that's a great um, situation. And, and I, I will start by saying, um, like when I see somebody, they, like the easiest capture in, in that scenario is someone who has cancer, right? They're newly diagnosed with cancer. They just had surgery. They've started chemotherapy. You do not need to know whether or not they had an inherited thrombophilia because they have enough right. provoking factors, right? So so that one, again, is, is easy. Um I've seen a lot of men under the age of 50 who've had particularly pulmonary emboli, right? And we really, really struggle to try to find, uh, uh, you know, provoking factors. I have had a couple, um, one a writer, one an anesthesiologist. They're both like, I was sitting in my chair and it's got this funny hard angle and it was pressing <laughs> against my leg and I didn't move for six hours. And I'm like, how can you not move for six hours? Well, I was writing. Uh, and then and then they have like a PE, right? And you're like, no, that, that's not enough, guys, right? We're all sitting at our desk. So, so um, in those patients, they may want to know why they had a clot. And, and as I've sort of alluded to, even if you find factor V Leiden mutation, that's not enough, right? It, it, may, it lowers the bar, but in and of itself, it doesn't cause the clot. So you need to have a provoking factor. And the thing with the unprovoked clots is that we don't know what that provoking factor was. We can't identify it. And if you can't identify it, it's 
it, it's likely you, you don't know whether it's still present or not, right? So the benchmark, my favorite is the gallbladder person, right? You know when it happened, you know the provoking factors over after eight to 12 weeks post-op, you're done. But in, in somebody like this, you don't know what the provoking factor was. And and people come with different milieu, right? They're, they're, they're pro, you know, remember Verkau's triad, right? Um, and so the inherited hypercoagulable state is not the only hypercoagulable state. And they may have other factors that contribute to inflammation. I mean, I've actually, you know, one, the one man I'm thinking of, who's the author with the chair that, you know, uh, that had the funny, uh, hard lip at the edge of the seat, um, was also overweight. Right. And so when we talk about indefinite duration anticoagulation, we're looking at like also for modifiable risk factors in some of these patients. He lost weight. His BMI was like 41 and he went down to, to 29 over the course of three wow. years. Oh. Yeah, because I said, hey, look, you know, obesity contributes to the risk and I can't find anything in you. And he, he got down to a BMI of like 27 or 28. And I said, okay, we'll take you off except at times of increased risk. So um, yes, people who appear to have unprovoked events, um, you don't know whether the risk is still present regardless of whether or not they have an inherited thrombophilia, I, I tend to keep anticoagulation going. Let's say it's a, a guy in his 40s, un, truly unprovoked, and they want to be tested. Um, is it even worth testing? Like we, you, you, you mentioned you want to be a couple, like two or three days off of the DOAX. And I, from reading, I believe it was in your paper, two weeks off of a uh, vitamin K antagonist. Uh, and so let's say he does six months for an initial clot uh, and then is is off of it and, and gets wants to get tested. How does how does how do you have that conversation with them? Because sounds like regardless of what you find, you're already going to maybe suggest that during uh, times of increased risk, they they take yeah. anticoagulant. So, again, this gets to why are you going to test? Right. Because you already in this patient. um are going to continue anticoagulation no matter what, right? And so then the question becomes, well, does the patient want to know, like, oh, my God, why did I have this PE? I, I really want to know some factors. Um, it, as I said, it, you know, it, I think for me, family situations, uh, um, it, it can help drive some decision making there. Mm -hmm. And and like one of the toughest is the 42 year old has, you know, a 16 year old daughter, right, uh, who wants to start oral contraceptives. So interestingly, the inherited thrombophilias don't really manifest their prothrombotic state until people are in their late teens and early 20s till they go through puberty and they have this hormonal milieu because otherwise before that it unless you have homozygous protein C or or really strong uh, protein S or antithrombin deficiency, uh, you know, neonatal purpura fulminans um, type of, of situation just from homozygous protein C deficiency. If you don't have that, you usually don't have a thrombotic event till, till later on. So the problem then becomes we don't have great data and there's a bit of a discussion. Should his, you know, 16, 17, 18-year-old daughter take combination oral contraceptives where we know that there's actually a synergy between, say, in heterozygous factor V Leiden uh, and combination oral contraceptives. And from some, some data that were done, you know, in like the late 1990s when factor V Leiden was discovered, you know, in the risk of factor V Leiden for, you know, for thrombosis, you know, the hazard ratio is about five. Uh, and so your heterozygous factor V Leiden and you add oral contraceptives, even for a woman, the, the risk goes from one to about three and a half. But if you have a, a, an inherited thrombophilia, your heterozygous factor five, your odds ratio now for having thrombosis with combination oral contraceptives plus uh, factor five Leiden is about 35. And if you're homozygous, it's like 80. Again, the numbers get kind of sketchy there because there aren't that many people to, to say with any certainty. So you're going to have to tell this person, you know, you're going to, you know, your kids could be at risk and your daughter can't take, you know, a uh, combination OCPs. So that is more why I might be likely to test mm. this patient than to drive any treatment decisions uh, about his own personal care. 
So thinking about these different variations of, of, of this case that we have and when we might consider testing for, for thrombophilia, I know one other item that, that comes up in thinking about thrombophilia testing is unusual locations of clots. So things like splanchnic locations, cerebral locations. How do you think about those differently and when you test for thrombophilia in those settings? Yeah, no, I, I think that's an excellent question. And, and I think we're still just grappling with how do we treat these, these you know, clots in the splanchnic veins or the cerebral sinus and, and how long do they need anticoagulation. Uh, and I will tell you that there is uh, an association between oral contraceptives in young women who have a, inherited factor V Leiden and prothrombin gene mutation. And so can't tell you how many I've seen, actually, it's unfortunate, you know, college age women who get headaches, they get nauseous, they throw up, they, they finally get testing and, and, and head imaging, and they're found to have cerebral sinus thrombosis. Uh, and it's the combination of uh, factor V Leiden or prothrombin gene mutation and the OCPs. The same is true for splanchnic vein thrombosis and, and prothrombin gene mutation. These beds are, un, these vascular beds are unusual and we don't understand what it is uh, that causes clots in these unusual locations, but we do um, look for the inherited thrombophilias in those cases, but it's also important to make sure that they do not have a myeloproliferative disorder, particularly with portal vein thrombosis where you might have splenomegaly and toss it off to portal hypertension and it's actually polycythemia vera or central thrombocytosis. We are going to move on to another case, but I, I just wanted to try to summarize a little bit, and I, I, I might have one, one last question on this topic. So what we talked about was initially a case of a woman with a family history uh, who had a provoked clot and how that would affect her. And it sounds like, especially for pregnancy planning or whether to use estrogen con containing contraception, you know, that would be something. And that if she was going to go back into another provoked situation, we would be giving her these short, uh, you know, a prescription for a DOAC or an oxaparin to just get, get her through that, which was super cool, something I hadn't heard of. And then we gave you the case, uh, some other variations. We gave you a case of a, a man with an unprovoked uh, DVT and talking about, yeah, we would treat and maybe part of the reason to test him would just be to uh, counsel him about his family. If he had a daughter that was, you know, thinking pregnancy, contraception, that sort of thing, it might factor in. But it, is there ever a time when it, a, like a man or somebody has an unprovoked clot and you just say, okay, your bleeding risk is low enough, we're just going to keep you on indefinite anticoagulation? Or do you always, do you prefer to do this sort of where you treat the initial clot and then you just sort of treat provoked situations moving forward. I guess that's something I'm still a little unclear on. Yeah, no, this is, I think this is a key point. Um, so, so patients who truly, as I like to say to them, have a clot that comes out of the blue, right? right. Um, they're not like, you know, I, I, I've seen people who, who get mono, you know, college students, and then they get a clot and that's a that's enough of a provoking factor that I would consider stopping. People who just get them out of the blue, um, you know, sitting for six hours and writing notwithstanding, and, and those people are included in this, um, they do benefit from indefinite duration anticoagulation. There is no doubt about it that the risk for all comers who have an unprovoked clot um, is about 10% per year in the first two years, and it's cumulative. So there's a 20% risk uh, if you stop anticoagulation after the first six to 12 months, at, at two years out, there's a 20% chance that they have a recurrent clot. And wow. that continues to accrue so that by five years, it's somewhere between 30, 40%. Now, you could flip the, you know, the other side and say, well, but if you give all those people anticoagulation, you're over-treating 60%. Uh, and we still have not resolved. We do not have like the best calculator or risk prediction score. What we do know is that men uh, under the age of 50 uh, who've had a pulmonary embolus have the highest risk of having a recurrent clot. So that their risk is actually higher than 10% per year. Um, and then we kind of work your way down. Um, and then men who have a lower extremity clot and women who have PE have about the same risk. Uh, so maybe your uh, young man with a PE, it's about 15, 17% risk per year for the first two years. These people is about 12. And then you get 
to women with the lower extremity uh, clots that's down below 10. So again, you have to look at the severity of the clot, the location, um, and the truly the fact that it's unprovoked. Um, as I alluded to in the beginning, the European Society of Cardiology says PE can be so devastating that everybody should just be considered as having mm. unprovoked. But I think that's a bit excessive and aggressive. What I do want to say about this topic is that uh, the reduced dose uh, Rivaroxaban and Apixaban strategies. Not sure if you're familiar with the Einstein Choice trial and the Amplify Extension trials. Those are fantastic trials. And I think for the majority of patients who require indefinite or long-term anticoagulation, that using reduced dose Rivaroxaban or Apixaban um, gives you the best of both worlds. Those data or why the ESC is saying everybody's with a PE should be treated, uh, you know, indefinitely. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much. All right, Malini, I think we have to get on to our next case. So we have um, another case for you. She is a 32-year-old woman, um, history of asthma and diabetes, has been trying to get pregnant over the past five years, but has unfortunately had three miscarriages before 10 weeks. She just moved to your city, established care with you as her new PCP. And she said that prior to moving here, her old doctor had sent some lab tests and a lupus anticoagulant test had come back positive. She hasn't had any additional testing, and she's wondering what this lab results means. This is a frequent consult, maybe not with the three miscarriages, but the one or the two, right? And I'm pretty um, compulsive about making sure that we really believe that the antiphospholipid antibodies that uh, have been tested are, are, are truly the appropriate tests um, and that, that they're done in the right fashion and that they're done more than once, right? So... Um, if you're suspecting antiphospholipid, and, and there's actually two, this patient um, might have what we call obstetric antiphospholipid syndrome, right? As opposed to somebody who has had like a PE or a DVT. So, so what are you going to do if you suspect anti uh, antiphospholipid syndrome? First of all, how do you suspect it? Well, I particularly look for people who have unexplained thrombotic events that are somewhat severe um, or unexplained, you know, venous thrombosis or cerebral, uh, like arterial thrombotic events, strokes, uh, bilateral renal infarcts. I just saw a woman like this actually last week. She has bilateral renal infarcts. She's 48. We have no idea why. Her antiphospholipid antibody testing was negative. But, you know, though that's the type of thing you would think of. And so um, there has been a lot of investigation into what antiphospholipid antibody tests are really are uh, specific and sensitive for the diagnosis, right? So there are a lot of tests out there that you could order that have no specificity and are not correlated with risk of thrombosis. Uh, so what we look for are the anticardiolipin IgG and IgM uh, and the beta-2 glycoprotein-1 IgG and IgM. And those are considered, you know, the anticardiolipin is considered one test, the beta-2 glycoprotein-1 is another. IgG has more specificity for or be, has a higher association with ha provoking thrombosis and having thrombosis than IgM. And part of the reason may be, as you know, the IgM is the pentamer and it's kind of easier to have nonspecific sticking and get some false positives, right? So, so those are ELISA-based tests. And we'll talk about those tests first because you have to have a titer that's high enough that that you're concerned about it. And so the, the titer that people get concerned about is a titer of 40, uh, you know, units or higher. Um, I, you know, if the threshold is, you know, less than 15 or less than 20, somebody with an acute illness is going to have a positive test, right? Kids who have strep throat all have like positive anticardiolipin antibodies, right? So, you know, you really have to be careful when you're testing somebody, what else is going on at the time they're, that they're being tested? 
uh, and in acute inflammatory disorders can give you positive uh, antibody tests like that. But also um, up to 5% and some people would even say 9% of like healthy blood donors. So healthy blood donors have been tested and a number of different people have looked at the prevalence of antiphospholipid antibodies in this population. And it's high, it's like 5%. And they're sitting there not doing anything. And so one of the problems is, is that no one has been able to find an assay that will tell you which antiphospholipid antibodies um, precipitate thrombosis and which are just kind of innocent bystanders floating around in the blood like an anti-staph or an anti-strep antibody, right? So, so that's what makes it hard. Um, and that's why not only do they have to be positive around the time that the event occurred, but then they also have to be persistently positive, at least, uh, you know, a 12 week or longer interval between testing. There are clot based assays um, and, and that's those are also um, much more finicky to do <laughs> than uh, than the ELISA based assays. Right. So you could have your patient sitting in the ED uh, and they just had a stroke and they're like, you know, a 43 year old woman. And you're like, well, is this, you know, cryptogenic idiopathic or is it antiphospholipid syndrome? You can send the ELISA assays and, and be pretty confident that you're going to get accurate results. You cannot send a clot-based assay because these are affected by anticoagulants. Mm -hmm. um, even though we try to do some manipulations, um, like you can take the patient's plasma and you can add heparinase and destroy any heparin in there, but you're still not 100% confident that you get result, good results. So antiphospholipid syndrome um, still carries the name of lupus anticoagulant syndrome, right? And these antiphospholipid antibodies were identified first in patients who have lupus. And people were looking for something in these patients with lupus who were getting clots. But when they looked at their blood in the test tube, their PTT was prolonged, right? And like, what was that all about, right? Well, in order to have the PTT run and even the PT, you need phospholipids in there because now I get to be technical and all coaggy. Uh -huh. um, the coag factors have to be in the right orientation in order for the enzyme to fit in the pocket and cleave them and activate them. And, and basically the coag cascade is a series of enzymatic activation reactions that ultimately lead in a clot. So you need phospholipid in there. And if you have antibody, antiphospholipid antibody in the test tube, it slows down the reaction between the clotting factors and the phospholipid and the binding and the orientation, and you get some steric interference. And you can also get that with beta-2 glycoprotein 1. It, it interferes with the, the, the ability of the factors to, to be activated and clot in the test tube. In vitro, they activate thrombosis. I'm sorry, in vivo. In people, they activate thrombosis. But in the test tube, they slow it down. So what you do to for these clot-based assays, and there's the dilute Russell Viper venom test. There's the kaolin uh, activation assay. There's the PTTLA, which is PTT lupus anticoagulant. That the PTTLA um, is probably the most commonly used. It, the machine that it's used on the Stago machine and reagents are pretty prevalent. And what that test does is actually dilute the phospholipid that so that the concentration of phospholipid is lower than in your standard PTT assay because now it makes the test much more sensitive to be able to detect the presence of, of an antiphospholipid antibody. And so if that PTTLA test um, or DRVVT, and I'll explain why the DRVVT, but the concept's the same. Um, if that test um, takes longer than normal to clot in the test tube, you then go on and do a confirmatory test. And the idea behind the confirmatory test is you're confirming that it's a lupus anticoagulant. So what do you do? You take the patient's plasma and you add um, a lot of excess phospholipid. And this is either smushed up platelets, the platelet neutralization procedure, or it's uh, hexagonal phase phospholipids. And you put it in the patient's plasma and all their antiphospholipid antibodies bind to these exogenous antiphos the anti 
exogenous phospholipids, and then you pull that out. And now you have the patient's treated plasma, and then you run that same PTTLA assay again. And now if you've removed the antiphospholipid antibody with this procedure, then the, the time it takes to clot in the test tube should be shorter and should be normal. And that's when you've confirmed that the test is positive. I spend, you know, at least, I don't know, 20 minutes every week explaining to somebody who sent these tests what those assays mean. Right? Um, <laughs> I had to look it up. Uh, and I, yeah, I was looking up diagrams to prepare for this to try to figure it out. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so, so I'm happy to discuss it, right? And dilute Russell Viper venom was actually is a snake venom right? Yeah. That, that activates further down in the coagulation cascade. So if you're somebody like that has, um, if you, if you have hemophilia, right, and you have a factor eight deficiency, well, it doesn't matter because DRVVT, uh, uh, the Lute Russell Viper venom activates 10 down at the bottom, and then it, it makes, pro, you know, prothrombin go to thrombin. And that's where some of the antiphospholipid antibodies seem to hang things up. Um, and the prothrombin to thrombin to, to cleavage part. So anyway, so those are the tests that we do. And so there are clot-based assays, there's the anti-cardiolipin, and there's the beta-2 glycoprotein 1. And those are the three groups. And so when you hear us talk about triple positive, you have a positive in any of those three. And the ELISA-based assays ha have to be high titer and they have to be persistently positive. And if three of them aren't positive, um, say two of them are, or one of them, say the PTTLA is positive and the beta two, those same tests have to be positive 12 weeks later, okay? Mm -hmm. Because otherwise you're just getting some random, you know, everybody, lots of people with COVID had antiphospholipid antibodies present, right? But that doesn't mean that they're persistent and doesn't mean that they're the cause of the clot. Do you care more about one of them than the others or kind of in terms of the ranking of them, how you think about that? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. And 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 someone, someone just published a paper about whether beta-2 glycoprotein 1 really means anything in this situation. Um, I will say that people have investigated like antiphosphatidylserine, right, uh, and, and IgA uh, uh, subtype, immunoglobulin subtypes, and those are not validated and correlated with the development of thrombosis in patients. And people are pretty rigorous about this. So I, I will say that one of my best strategies for truly identifying uh, antiphospholipid syndrome is to look at the patient's baseline PTT before any anticoagulation. And if that's elevated, then you're pretty confident that it's a strong antiphospholipid antibody, right? Because remember, it doesn't have the dilute phospholipid that the PTTLA has. Say so it's got a high concentration of phospholipid. So if that's prolonged and they have a pro positive clot-based assay, um, then I'm pretty confident in that. Um, in our institution, the DRVBT is actually a terrible test and everybody has a positive and half of us discount it if it's the only <laughs> test that's positive, right? So, so you kind of have to know your own own lab. Um, but, but, you know, I see, so I, I, I see a lot of patients from our rheumatology service, right? And, and like, when do these ever become criteria for diagnosis, diagnosing lupus, right? Or RA, but they send them all in their patients who've never had a clot. And then you find these really high titers, like really, really high, like 800, 1,000, 1,500 units, you know, for ACL or beta 2. And you're like, oh, my God, well, and they're like, well, should we anticoagulate them? And the answer is no, um, because they haven't had a clot. Um, and we know in patients who have lupus that they do have an increased risk of developing a thrombotic event, but it's, it's around in very poorly done studies, 9 to 10%. Okay, and poorly done, meaning they don't have a lot of patients, they don't have rigorous, you know, uh, documentation of the levels. Um, so, so that's, um, you know, something that I, I, we treat those, pa I, I give them aspirin, there's some anecdotal data that aspirin might work for those patients with collagen vascular disorders and high titers, but not every patient will take it. Um, and it's usually the patients who have some thrombocytopenia due to an antiphospholipid antibody that we also um, 
consider aspirin. So getting back to our patient here, right? So she's somebody that I would want to know when the antiphospholipid antibody panel was done in um, relation to timing of the um, uh, miscarriages, uh, although three sequential ones, um, uh, you know, is, is a bit telling, and that meets the Sapporo criteria or the the Sydney criteria, which are the revised Sapporo criteria. Um, the other thing I want to, and, and I just throw this out here for general medical knowledge, is the the other thing too is actually looking um, for chromosomal abnormalities. Um, and, and making sure that they've had some other diagnostic workup um, for like chromo chromosomal abnormalities in, in the embryo, chromosomal abnormalities in the parents. I, I saw one couple um, and uh, for antiphospholipid syndrome, right? And that's actually how they got to the rheumatologist who then sent the patient to me. Uh, and they were from, they were related from a vi village in a Middle Eastern country, uh, and they both carried a gene defect that that was, you know, homozygous lethal. Um, so it took a while to identify that. So, so again, you want to, you know, in this situation, you want to um, do all the due diligence about reasons for having miscarriages. And then, if you think it's antiphospholipid li obstetric antiphospholipid syndrome, um, then then you treat accordingly. Um, you know, the second and third trimester uh, pregnancy losses are, are very sad. Um, and usually not only do you have uh, persistently positive tests, but you also have um, like placental pathology, which is pretty telling. So what we talked about so far, you said testing at the time of the, like testing at the time of the clot or in the case of obstetric antiphospholipid, we're testing like as close as we can to the, the, the most recent miscarriage and that the anticardiolipin IgG, IgM or the beta 2 glycoprotein 1, we're looking for titers at least 40 and then whatever your clot-based assay, you like the PTT lupus anticoagulant, PTT LA, the the dilute Russell Viper venom tests does you know may is maybe a little sketchy compared to that. Well, in our lab, in okay. your lab, but <laughs> so, so make sure you know your lab. Talk to your local right. hematologist right. about that one. Um, and so, what what might you be talking to this woman about treatment for a future pregnancy? And then maybe we can vary the case up and and give her a different type of clotting. You know, again, in this situation, we want to try to do everything we can to maximize a pregnancy outcome, right? Um, and, and that's why I went into, you know, detail, making sure there's nothing else going on. Anatomy is normal and that there's no, uh, father of the baby problems with sure. sperm mm -hmm. and all that stuff. Right. So, um, um, it is, it is very hard to study pregnant women for a lot of different reasons. Right. And, and one of the biggest reasons is, for a lot of these studies is that, no pregnant woman wanted to be randomized, right? So if they had had a miscarriage, you're, you know, they, they're like some, some Canadian friends of mine tried to do a study. They had to shut it down, right? Because they were trying to randomize to, you know, anoxaparin versus placebo. Well, no one wanted placebo, right? Okay. So they couldn't, they couldn't get anybody to participate in the study. All right. So, so the data are not great, but we do think that uh, anoxaparin and aspirin can improve the live birth rate. And so women who've been diagnosed with obstetric antiphospholipid syndrome um, and have had, you know, second or third trimester pregnancy losses or have had three miscarriages or, you know, more or less, um, they have about a 70 to 80 percent live birth rate if you use anoxaparin and aspirin. Uh, again, knowing that those data, you know, are not a rigorous RCT placebo controlled uh, situation. And is that aspirin 81, 81. and uh, yes. uh, low molecular weight heparin prophylactic dosing or therapeutic dosing? Usually prophylactic dosing, 40 milligrams of noxaparin or the equivalent. Um not therapeutic. Um, there's a lot of hand waving about um, using intermediate dose, which is like one milligram per kilogram once a day. 
which COVID brought to the forefront to like everyone's, what do you mean intermediate dose? Um, in, because of volume and distribution during pregnancy, change in blood volume, uh, increased uh, GFR, all of those things. But 40 should be, 40 is sufficient. So let's say that uh, Miss M is, she's still a 32-year-old woman, um, but instead of presenting to you with a history of miscarriages, she actually presents uh, with a stroke. Um, how would this change how you think about her in terms of sending uh, a hypercoagulability workup broadly, um, both in terms of antiphospholipid syndrome and also in terms of the other thrombophilias? What you really need to look for in a young person who has had a stroke is to make sure they do not have antiphospholipid uh, syndrome. Um, again, you know, uh, there's a lot about idiopathic, cryptogenic, one-off, never to be repeated again, stroke events that we can't explain, but you want to make sure that you don't miss uh, a stroke due to APS because strokes with APS are likely to recur. Um, and they are likely to recur even on um, uh, uh, anticoagulation, therapeutic dose anticoagulation with rivaroxaban or apixaban. So if we um, look at the TRAPS trial data, which was a fantastic study run in Italy, which took patients who had um, triple positive antiphospholipid uh, uh, markers, uh, persistently positive and, and met rigorous criteria. And they took these patients and they randomized to rivaroxaban therapeutic dose versus warfarin with an INR of 2.0 to 3.0. No matter what type of clot you had in association with your antiphospholipid syndrome, whether it was venous or arterial, you were at increased risk of having a recurrent event with rivaroxaban, and all those recurrent events were arterial, either strokes or MI. So it's very, very important not to miss uh, uh, antiphospholipid syndrome in the setting of a stroke, uh, because we would treat that person with warfarin. And I had one great patient who I saw like in June and I explained the TRAPS trial and he, he was an engineer, so he could like get the graphs when I showed him the risk of recurrence, but his son was getting married six weeks later and we didn't want to transition to warfarin. So we kept him on it and then he transitioned to warfarin because it's risk over time, right? So mm -hmm. I know people kind of like, oh my God, the eye patient has antiphospholipid. I've got to call him up. It's two in the morning and I'm looking at the labs and I got to put him on warfarin, right? You got a little bit of time there, but, but you do have to um, really keep that at the forefront when someone's had an arterial event. So- we we've realized uh, midway through this that this should be its own show. So I think we're definitely going to have to have it's a separate show for the listeners on antiphospholipid. I know we're leaving a lot on the table here, but you know we do this at night. We all have things to do tomorrow, so it's it's late. So we're gonna we're gonna get some take home points. But Gene, this has been fantastic. I can't thank you enough for all your time. I know your dog was missing you, so the dog's been recording with us for the last half of the show. Uh, this this has been great. But can you give the audience uh, maybe uh, two take home points, maybe three take home points uh, from what we've discussed tonight? Absolutely. And for, and I want to thank you all for inviting me. It's been a great discussion and it's actually been a lot of fun. So if you're going to do inherited thrombophilia testing in someone who's had a venous thrombotic event, know what you're going to do when you find the results, right? Um, you know how that's going to change your management or not of your patient. Because in most situations, it should not change your management. It's the other situational factors in your patient um, that, that will affect how long you give anticoagulation for. And then the second part is for stroke in young people, um, you know, under the age of 50, even under the age of 60, think of antiphospholipid syndrome, uh, because that's one thing you do not want to miss. And it's one thing that you would treat differently, unlike inherited thrombophilias, where no matter what you find, you're really not going to treat the patient very differently. Um, it, you will treat somebody who has true antiphospholipid syndrome and a CNS, uh, you know, arterial thrombotic event differently because you'll give them warfarin. I would give them warfarin, even if they're double positive and even if they're single positive with a stroke. <laughs>
This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. (laughs) Perfect. Get show notes at thecurbsiders.com and sign up for our mailing list to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. Plus, twice each month, you'll get our Curbsiders Digest, recapping the latest practice-changing articles, guidelines, and news in internal medicine. And we're committed to high-value, practice-changing knowledge. And to do that, we need your feedback. So please subscribe, rate, and review the show on YouTube, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts. You can also send an email to askcurbsiders at gmail.com. A reminder that this and most episodes are available for CME through VCU Health at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. Uh, we also now have a Patreon, so you can sign up for that if you want to get bonus episodes and add free versions of every episode at patreon.com slash curbsiders. And I wanted to give a special thanks to our writers and producers for this episode, Malini Gandhi and the great Dr. Nora Toronto, and to our whole team. The show is produced by the team at Podpaste. Elizabeth Proto runs our social media. And Stuart Brigham composed our theme music. And with all that, until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. I've been Malini Gandhi. And I haven't been Paul Williams today. I've been Dr. <laughs> Nora Toronto. <laughs> 